Every family is like a circus. There are clowns, wild animals, and even daredevils. Which are you most like? Are you the strong man? Or maybe the bearded lady? Do you feel like you're walking on a tightrope? Or constantly taming lions? Do you feel like your family is just a spectacle for the whole world to see? Well, in this series, we will discover how God can transform your marriage, parenting, and family from a sideshow into the greatest show on earth. Welcome, everybody, to week number four. We are concluding our series titled Family Circus. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us today from The Loft. Thank you guys so much for creating an awesome environment where people can find and follow Jesus apart from the big crowds, apart from the big sound and the big noise. So thank you. And also thanks for the rest of you joining us online from all around the world. Well, as we conclude our series, we've been really looking at the fact that our family is a lot like a circus. You've got clowns running around, annoying you, demanding your attention. You've got, you know, daredevils who are shooting themselves out of cannon and wrecking themselves on a daily basis. And, of course, you have the wild animals that you feel like all you do is feed them and clean up their messes. Family life's a lot like a circus. The reality is sometimes it's kind of hard to find the fun in all of the dysfunction that can come along with family life. Our goal in this series is for us to allow God to just transform our marriage, our family, our parenting, and all that stuff involved so that we might go from some kind of a sideshow to the greatest show on earth. And today, I want to talk with you about a three-ring circus. If you have a Bible, turn your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to be in the Old Testament. That's the fifth book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. If you do not have a Bible, don't worry. We'll put everything on the screen so we can follow along together. And I also want to encourage some note-taking for sure. So if you'd like to just do it the old-fashioned way in front of you in the seat back, pull out a piece of paper, take notes. If you're a little more tech-savvy, turn on your Bible and your smartphone, the YouVersion Bible app. If you look up the live event Colonial Church, you'll see our notes there. You can click on that, take notes as we move through the message together. Well, as we get started today, by show of hands, how many of you have ever had uh, something passed down to you from someone in your family? Can I see your hands? Now, the truth is, every hand should have gone up because in every family, something is passed down to every family member. Uh, maybe it's a family ability, maybe your family athletic ability, you know, passed down through your family. Maybe in your family, it's musical ability passed down. Like in my family, I'm a musician. I have three sons. All three of them are musicians. My father was a professional musician his whole life. That's all he did for a living. My grandfather, my grandmother were musicians. Musical ability passed down through my family. Or maybe in your family, um, academic ability has been passed down, you know, intellectual smarts and all that kind of stuff. Kind of reminds me of the guy who turned to his wife and said, honey, don't you think our son got his brains from me? To which the wife replied, yeah, yeah, he did. And lucky for us, I've still got mine. <laughs> ability passed down. Maybe it's family ability. Maybe it's a family trait. Maybe in your family, there's the family nose, right? Or maybe like the family body shape. Like everybody in your family is not maybe vertically challenged. Or maybe they're really tall. Or maybe in your family, they're very narrow. Or maybe they're very not narrow. And you, you Maybe in your family, it's the family hair. Maybe it's red hair. Maybe it's no hair. Or in my case, both of those. Passed down through the family. Thank you, Grandpa. I remember years ago, one of my kids said, Dad, uh, you know you're losing your hair, right? To which I replied, Son, you know you're looking into your future, right? <laughs> right here. This is you. True or false? Everybody help me out. Some things run in families. True or false? It's true. Some things run in families. Here's the question. What runs through your family? What is your family history? Fun fact, at the beginning of every Bible, a personal Bible, when you give, get a Bible that you give away to a person, the personal Bibles, in the beginning of all of them, you'll find these crazy little pages that contain a space for you to write your family history. For example, in the beginning of my Bible, I've got these blank pages right here. I can write down like marriage, I can write like births. In fact, on the very next page, it actually has two pages, one for marriages, another for deaths I can record. And then here's another page right after that. Here's a page, family record. I can write down in my Bible my family story. Here's a question. If you were to write down your family story, 
in your Bible, what might that story include? Because here's the bad news. For many of you, the family history is full of good and bad and even some ugly. Like for many of you, if you were to write your family history, you would write a family history of maybe depression, emotional turmoil. Some of you might write a family history that includes details of addiction. Maybe it's gambling or maybe drugs or alcohol or, or, or some other form of addiction. Some of you, your family history would include rejection or maybe abuse or abandonment. Some of you, some of you, your family history might detail laziness, indifference, apathy. Your family history, that's the thing that's been passed down to you. Now, here's the good news. The good news is, though the Bible does provide a space at the beginning to record your family history, the whole rest of the Bible shows us how God can rewrite your family history from whatever it's been to whatever God intended for it to be. If you're taking notes, say, here's our big idea. You can write this down. Whatever your family history, God can write you a new one. Whatever your family history, good, bad, ugly, whatever, God can write you a new one. Now, by show of hands, how many of you ever heard of the phrase family curse? The family curse. You've heard of the family curse? Somebody's like, oh, family curse. In our family, it's flat feet or crooked teeth. That's the family curse. Others of you are like, no, in our family curse, it's, it's a medical condition that has run through the family. And we're very weary of this medical condition. Some of you, family curse, you, when you hear that, you think of a bad temper. You know, runs right through the family. Listen, running through every family is a family history that either looks like God's blessing or it looks like some cycle called the family curse. Three facts I want to get on the table before we get really going here today. Fact number one, if you are a human being and you've been raised by human beings, then your family history runs all the way back to the early chapters of Genesis. You can trace your family history right back to Adam and Eve, our primary parents. In other words, you and I, we come from a long line of sinners. And the cycle that they put into play has been passed all the way down, even to you and to me. The cycle of sin, rejecting God, distortion, being kind of warped by our own selfishness, and then dysfunction. Nothing works as it's intended. That's fact number one. Fact number two, this cycle of sin and distortion and dysfunction is often repeated in families. And it's not just repeated in families, it's repeated through family generations. But the good news is that Jesus Christ can break those cycles in families and in family generations. Which takes me to fact number three, parents. The decisions you are making today, today, determine what's going to run through your family. The rhythms, parents, that you are putting into play today, the rhythms whereby you run your family, that will indicate your family history, the thing that you passed down. Here's my question. Does it look like the blessing of God or does it look like the same old family curse? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, Creation and Fall, said it this way, quote, Blessing and curse are burdens that God lays upon humankind. They are inherited from one generation to the other, often not understood, often uncomprehended, but they are altogether real. Question. If you have a family history of like a cycles that need to be broken, like, and it feels like a family curse, how can we ever go from those cycles to something better? How can we go from the old family curse to God's blessing? How can that be? Well, that's exactly what we see, exactly what we see playing out in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Before we jump in, a little bit of background is in order. Moses is the author of the book of Deuteronomy, and the book of Deuteronomy is addressing the second generation of God's people, Israel. In fact, the name Deuteronomy, Deuteros, means second. Namos means law, second law. It's, it's the second giving of the law to the second generation of God's people. The first generation of God's people, Israel, came out of 400 years of slavery, the Exodus generation. 400 years of slavery in Egypt, but as soon as they got free, what did they do? They rebelled against God, went their own way, and they perished after 40 years of wandering around in 
the wilderness. And then the next generation, their children, that's the people in Deuteronomy 6. And this Deuteronomy generation rises up. And all that they have known are those cycles of sin and distortion and dysfunction. They had a distorted view of God, a distorted view of life, a distorted view of themselves. They had nothing but dysfunctional family history passed down to them. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Because this is all they knew. And here in chapter 6, God invites that generation to a new opportunity to write a new family story, all by getting into a covenant relationship with God through this text called the Shema. And I'll explain more about the Shema in just a minute. Now, if you've ever been to a circus, you're familiar with the idea of a three-ring circus. A three-ring circus is where you have three centers of activity, three acts, all being performed at the exact same time. They're all happening at the same time. You've got one here, one here, one there, and they're all going on at the same time. At Deuteronomy 6, we see like a three-ring circus, three actions, three performances, three things happening at the same time. And when these three happen at the same time, family cycles are broken. When these things happen at the same time, a new family history can be written. And so we're going to be talking today about writing a new family history. And you can write this down. There are three things, three rings, three factors. You can write them down. Number one, three factors to a new family history. Number one, factor number one is God. You are one and only. God, you're one and only. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you have ever been to a wedding before? Uh, let me ask you, what's your favorite part of the wedding? Uh, is it like the vows? Is it the ring? Is it like the kiss? Is it like the cake? Is it the bride coming down? Is it the presentation? Like, what's your favorite part of the wedding? Because for me, I've officiated many, many weddings. Love to do them. My favorite part of the wedding is the vows. Because at the moment of the vows, a marriage is born right there. And it's not just that a marriage is born. A family is born right there. In other words, the couple doesn't make vows. The vows make vows the couple, and the vows make the family. The moment of the vows is the moment a family is born, a marriage is born. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we talk about a new family history. It all begins with the vows. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Why don't you notice this? Scripture says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I want to draw your attention to that first word, hear, hear, O Israel. In Hebrew, it's the word Shema. That's where we get the idea of Shema. It's the first word. Hear, O Israel, or Shema Israel. Adonai Aleheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel. It's an imperative command that literally means to obey. Obey what? To obey all the stuff that's about to follow. All of the descriptions of what a genuine, real, covenant relationship with God really looks like. And that's what follows in verses 5 through 9. Now, in the same way that in a wedding, the vows establish the covenant relationship between husband and wife and God, so also with the Shema, it establishes our priorities with God. So here's a little definition of the Shema, just so you can get a handle on it, okay? Here's the definition. You can write this down if you like. Shema. The Shema is the personal confession of faith and loyalty to God from his covenant people, Israel. It comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. The personal confession of faith and loyalty to God from his covenant people, Israel. So there's a few facts I do need to throw at you. So newsflash number one, you need to know about Jesus taught the Shema. And he called it the great commandment, and he called it the first commandment. Commandments, what Jesus called it. It's the Shema because it all sums up in one place what it means to know God. Fact number two that you need to know about. The Shema are the first words taught to every Jewish child. The Hebrews raise their children to first words out of the baby's mouth. Shema Israel. First thing they speak. Shema is also the last words that Jewish martyrs would utter. Also, very often, the last words at last rites at the deathbed. Shema, first words, last word. Shema was turned into a prayer. That Shema prayer is recited by every observant Jew twice daily, in the morning and in the evening. Jesus Christ prayed the Shema. Jesus Christ taught the Shema. Jesus Christ lived the Shema. 
And then the third fact you need to know about, if God's people would have followed the Shema, they would have had a totally different family story. If they would have just simply followed the Shema, their story would have been so different. So let's break it down. There are two articles in the Shema, basically, that we need to look at. The first one, you need to understand it's a confession of faith. You can write that down if you like. It is a, con- is a confession of faith. Notice the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Notice those two words, our God. The Lord our God is a simple confession of personal faith in the Creator God. In fact, 250 times Moses, the author, referred to the Lord your God to the people of Israel. But here's the problem. In the generation before, the parents of the Deuteronomy generation, the wilderness generation, here's God's description of them in Deuteronomy 132. God says that their parents did not believe in the Lord your God. The result, they wandered and they died in the wilderness. Parents, let me ask you, do you trust God? No, do you really trust God. It's not a box that you check. Because as soon as you check it, you got to check it every other second. It never goes away. You've got to constantly reach. Listen, nothing less than total trust in God is going to break any cycles in your family. If you think faith is like a one-time shot thing, there are no cycles broken in your family. It's going to be the same old story, same old family curse. The Shema is a declaration of personal, ongoing faith and trust in God. So it is definitely a a confession of faith. Second thing is a confession of faithfulness. It is a confession of faithfulness. Notice also, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Then it goes on to say, the Lord is one. In Hebrew, it literally means the Lord alone. Now, here's the truth. The parents of the Deuteronomy generation, their parents, as soon as they were freed from their slavery, you know what they did? They chased other gods. They chased a whole bunch of other gods. And in chasing those other gods, they wandered and they perished out there in the wilderness. They died in the desert. In fact, if you have your Bible open and Deuteronomy 6 is right in front of you, look at verse 14 very quickly. It says this. God says to the Deuteronomy generation, you shall not go after other gods, not the gods of the people all around you. Listen, parents, there are rival gods. Then... And now, parents, let me give you some rival gods that exist today that if you pursue those gods, you will perish, and so will your children. God number one, the God of busyness. Ask anybody today how they're doing. How are you doing? Busy? Okay, we're all kind of busy. Parents, you can be so busy that the whole God thing gets pushed over here. Problem, problem. Sometimes the baby's ugly, and I'm just going to say it. Friends, the baby's ugly. If you're busy running around and your family doesn't have a solid God thing going on, that's a rival God. Here's another God. How about the God of travel? Oh, we do this, we go here, we go there. It's great, that's fine, that's, that's great. But if God is getting pushed away, not just from you, but from the relationships within your family, if God's getting pushed aside because you're traveling, guess what you have? You have another God. Anything that takes his place or competes with him, there's your other God. Let me just keep going. I mean, if the baby's ugly, let's describe the baby. How about the God of sports? For many of us, we're running around. Listen, if your kid can handle a ball and can't handle a Bible, what does it say about your parenting? I'm just, baby's ugly, friends. We're just going to say it. There are rival gods. What do you think? The gods just like this bowl made of gold or something? No, no. They look like the things that compete and rival for God. Substitutes for God. We have them today, just like they had them then. For some of us, The rival gods could just be relationships, other people, other things, anything other than God. Everybody do me a favor. Answer out loud, okay? Ask a question, answer it out loud. Here we go. If a wife is 85% faithful to her husband, is she a faithful wife? No. If a husband keeps his marriage covenant only on the weekends, is he a faithful husband? Then why do we treat God the same way? Like we divide our life into compartments. Like this one's like all about God and this one's all about me. Really? Does that work that way? It does not work that way. How do I know? Look at your kids. Look at your family. Why would we treat God that way? Married couples don't make vows. Vows make the couple. Vows make the family. And a new family history begins with the vow. Here's the vow. God is my one. God is my only. And when God is my one and my only, he's our one and our only. And we're on the right track. 
Anything other than that, not the right track. 12th century theologian Bernard of Clairvaux said it this way, quote, He who would not be ruled by the gentleness of God should be ruled as a punishment by his own self, the unsupportable burden of their own will. Question, which do you want to run in your family? The gentleness of God or the burden of your own self will? You decide, parents. It's all up to you. Three factors to new family history. Factor number one is God your one and only. Factor number two, write this down, you. You're the second. There's three rings. They go at the same time. They're happening together. Second ring, you. Loving God, holy. You. Loving God, holy. Now, how many of you, as a confession before others, before God and these witnesses would acknowledge that you do, in fact, know what dysfunction feels like? Can I see your hands? Some of you go, yeah, I know exactly what that feels like. I know what that feels like. Here's a question. Where does dysfunction come from? Like, if you were to take this thing called dysfunction, grab the wire and follow the wire all the way back to what? Like, what's the source of dysfunction? Here's the answer. Dysfunction flows from disordered love. Disordered love. Sometimes we love the wrong things. For example, a guy like, hey, I love killing kittens. You're like, dude, not okay to kill kittens? Not okay to love killing kittens, okay? So sometimes we love the wrong things. Sometimes we love the right things in the wrong order. I love kittens so much, I neglect my family, don't pay the bills, and their kids are all neglected. And so my love for kittens has somehow replaced, like what? So theologians call this ordo amoris, the order of our loves. Listen, disordered loves play out in dysfunctional lives. Anytime there's dysfunction out here, guess what? It's an expression of disorder right here. So if I see dysfunction in any way, shape, or form, and I draw the lines back to the source, where's the source? It's right here. Everybody point to the problem. Where's the problem? It's right here. Anytime there's dysfunction out here, you can trace it right back to here. The Shema lays out the right order of our loves for the person, for the parent, and as a result, for the family. Do not forget the context of Deuteronomy 6 is a new generation to parent in a way the other one didn't. Don't forget this. So we're in Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 and 6. Moses goes on, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. I well, draw attention to this word love. You shall love the Lord your God. In Hebrew, it's ahav. One scholar said it this way, quote, the verb communicates not so much an emotional idea as one of covenant commitment to be absolutely loyal in every respect to God. My friends, in the scriptures, love and loyalty of God are linked inseparably. In fact, notice now in verse 5, I want you to notice how many times the word all appears. I think it's about three times. You're like, all your heart, all your soul, all your might. The word all in Hebrew is the word kol. Kol means whole, total, the whole thing. Uh, true or false, everybody help me out. True or false, some people are half-hearted with God. True or false? It's true. Parents, are you half-hearted toward God? Are you like half in, half out, like part-time God, part-time you, part, like, are you, because that's what's going on here. That's the warning. Dysfunctional families are the result of disordered loves. Now, don't forget, you cannot forget the context. The context is one generation wandered away from God and died in the wilderness, and now their children are rising up, and they have a new opportunity to write a new family story, not like the old one that ended badly, but a new one. And so they get the challenge. Unlike their parents who wandered around and died, they missed God's promised place because they loved other things more than God. We surveyed 100 people. The top three answers are on the board to this question. Name something that people love more than God. Name something people love more than God. Number three, ding, 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 things. 
Some people love things more than God. There are some parents, they love their job more than God. They love money more than God. They love possessions more than God. They love things more than God. If you love things more than God, guess what? The wandering has begun. We surveyed 100 people. Top three answers are on the board to this question. Name something people love more than God. Things. Number three, ding, ding, ding. Number two, ding, ding, ding. Others. Others. There are some people who put relationships with other people before their relationship with God. Listen, I believe there's somebody here tonight who has a boyfriend, and that boyfriend is drawing you away from God. Oh, but I want my boyfriend. Well, what about God? There's some, your spouse is drawing you away from God. What good are you going to be to your spouse if you wander away from God? None. There are some parents who have relationships, could even be in your own family. The idol of family is a big idol. There are many of us here, we idolize our family so much so that we don't even bring them to God. We just like, oh, we can't do that thing over there because we got this family thing. We can love our family more than God. I don't know if you recall the words of Jesus talking about like, hey, you know, hate your mother and brother and so forth. What's he talking about? Primary loyalty and allegiance goes to God, not to your family, because you're no good to them if you have it all backward and you've got disordered love. You're no good to anyone. We surveyed 100 people. Top three answers are on the board of the question. Name something people love more than God. Number three, things. Number two, others. Number one, ding, 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 self. Self. The bottom line is we just tend to be loyal to our own wants, needs, preferences, desires, traditions, whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever we want. That's how it plays out. The root of all dysfunction is a disordered love. And the truth is the Deuteronomy generation, they needed to be taught how to love God in the same way that you, my friends, and me, we need to learn how to love God as a family. Notice in verse 6 now, it says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Again, Jesus called this the first and greatest command. Now, Jews had a habit of counting. They counted up 613 commands of God in the Old Testament, 365 positive ones, 248 negative ones. So, like, man, here's you got to manage all this. Jesus comes along. He's like, no, there's one. Love God first. It's only one. In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. Parents, here's what you need to do. Here's what I need to do. Here's what we need to do every day. To give all that you know of yourself to all that you know of God. To give all that you understand of yourself to all that you understand of God. This is the duty of the parent. This is the duty. Now, don't forget the context. The previous generation wandered off and they all died and their next generation rises up and God gives them new opportunity. Let me just say this. I'm trying to be honest with you. If you're a parent today and you're half-hearted with God, you're hurting your family. If you're a parent today and you're a part-time God thing, you think the little bit of God is going to like have a positive influence? It's the other not God that's going to have the influence. Trust me, I know. I deal with people all day long who wandered away from the church and always point to a half-hearted parent somewhere along the line. Tag, you're it. Half-hearted worship is no good for anybody, you, God, or your kids. Whatever disorder is in you, parents, in your loves, it's going to flow out in your family. That's just the way it is. In a 1951 letter to a friend, C.S. Lewis gave him this advice. He said, put first things first, and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first, and we lose both. First and second things. The great Augustine in his book Confessions, I think hit the nail on the head when he said this. He said, quote, For thou hast commanded, and so it is, that every inordinate affection should be its own punishment. Parents, I know this sounds rough. I was trying to be honest. What family story are you writing? Half-hearted, half in, half out? What family, what are you handing down to your kids? What's running through your family? A part-time following of God? Half-hearted love? What's, or that loyal love to God, the one and only. The Shema, 
points the way to rightly ordered love, which is how a new story gets written. Three factors to new family history. Number one, God, your one and only. Two, you, loving God, holy. Number three, number three, your family. There are three things going together. Your family, learning God relationally. Learning God relationally. By show of hands, how many of you are forgetful? Forgetful? I'm forgetful. You can forget, like, appointments. You can forget errands and tasks. You can forget people. One time I was dating my wife a long, long time ago. I was supposed to pick her up from school, and I forgot. And she walked home 13 miles. You know what I didn't forget? I didn't forget to buy beer, and I didn't forget to go to band practice. But I forgot to pick her up. You can forget people. Let me tell you, I'm still hearing about it. (laughs) Newsflash. The wilderness generation that died, that one, they're the generation that forgot God. They forgot. Now, Jesus Christ quotes Deuteronomy more than any other book in the Bible. Why does he quote Deuteronomy the absolute most? Because Deuteronomy constantly reminds us not to forget God. In fact, I counted up 14 times the phrase, you shall remember, occurs in Deuteronomy. In fact, here's a little Bible study for you. Look up Deuteronomy 4.9 later and read it on your own. Deuteronomy 4.9. God says, unless you forget. So here's the question. Here's an interesting question. How can you remember not to forget God? How can you remember not to forget God? Here's the answer. It's surprising. By passing him on to your kids. When you're passing God on to your kids, you're not forgetting anything. When you're not passing God on to your kids, he's like any other thing you don't really care much about. You forget. You always forget about stuff that doesn't matter. The Shema for parents sets for us a rhythm of what relating with God in our family might look like. Let me just say this. This rhythm, this is what breaks the cycles. This rhythm, this is what rewrites the family history. This is it. This is the rhythm. Three things, very quickly, I'll give them to you very quickly. Parents, you can write these down. Number one, parents, teach in life's moments. Teach in life's moments. Verse 7 says this. You shall teach them the commandments to you. Uh, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. I want you to notice this word teach. You shall teach. The, the root of this word in Hebrew is shanan. Shanan. It means to engrave. Parents, you are to engrave the truth of God. What a covenant, loyal relationship with God looks like in the hearts of your kids. A couple of things pop out to me. Newsflash. Here's number one. Parents, you're responsible for your spiritual development of your kids. It's not the church's job to, to disciple your kids. It's your job, period. You drop them off, drive away, you fail. It's not our job. It's your job. We can partner. We're here to help. That's your job. You stand before Jesus, he ain't looking at me. He's looking at you. I want you to notice in that verse 7, the word you occurs seven times. You shall teach and deliver to your children. When you're at your house, when you walk, when you lie down, when, when you run, seven times. Parents, when it comes to your children's spiritual development, it's all about you. Second little fact here is this is not about church life. Oh, I need to get my kids here on Wednesdays or whatever. No, it's not, it's not what it's about. It's about everyday life. You know how I know? Look at the terms of the text. Look at the rhythm that's being described. When you sit down, when you walk by the way, when you lie, when you rise. This is life, everyday life. And then the third thing, it's all about the journey. It's all about, can I ask you a question? As parents, do you know how to journey with your children? Because I'm going to tell you, my observation of a lot of Christian parents, they don't know how to journey with their children. Let me tell you what, for what our experience has been, what teachable moments are. Like, what are life moments look like? Here's the, here they are. This is just what we have seen. Life moments for us with our kids have been when they mess up. When they mess up is not the time to blow your stack and be rude and go, I can't believe you. That's not the time for that. It's a time to go, is that who you want to be? It was your call, and you made it. Look what happened. Is this what you want? Teachable moment, when they blow it. Here's another teachable moment, when they're hurting. Maybe a friend dies, or maybe a disappointment occurs, and they're hurting. That's a teachable moment. Not to preach, to journey. Uh, How about when there's a decision to make? When your kid is forced with a decision, do you know how to walk with your children? I'm going to tell you right now, most of the parents that I know, they, they just, they never thought about journeying with their kids. Unreal. Parents, 
teach in life's moment. Second thing, parents, teach by life example. Teach by life example. Uh, verse 8, he says, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Notice this word, your, occurs two times. Whose hand? Whose eyes? The parents. One of the big mistakes parents make is they think that what their kids need is for you to nag the Word of God into their lives. That's not what they need. They need to see you living it. That's what they need to see. The idea of it being a sign doesn't mean literally tie it. The, the Jewish people like to take things super literally, so they would create this thing called a tefillin, and the tefillin is a little box with a band on it, and they put scriptures in, they tied it to their hand, and they tied it to their head, and they walked on, there, we're doing it. It's like, okay, no. He's not really talking about put a scripture on your head. He's like, hey, how about your kids see it on you? There's a novel idea. I remember years ago, there's a drug commercial, and the parent walks in the room and catches the kid doing drugs in the act. Remember the commercial? Kids doing drugs, looks up, <gasps> and the mom's like, <gasps> and they're like, <gasps> and it's back and forth. Remember that? And the mom's like, how did you, how? and the kid goes, I learned it from watching you. Is there any other way? Is there any way your kids are going to learn? They're gonna, everything they learn, they'll learn from watching you. You're half-hearted with God, guess what they're going to be? You skip out, they're skipping out. You mail it in, they mail it in. You check the box, they check Hey, listen, when it comes to parenting your kids and, and spiritual development, it's monkey see, monkey do. Third thing, parents, you know, teach in life's moments. Secondly, teach by life example. Number three, teach through your home. Teach through your home. Verse nine, you shall write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. You know, doorpost, house, gates. What's he talking about? He's talking about a God-centered home. To this day, Jews put a masuza inside their door. When you walk into the right, you see, we have one in our house. My wife's Jewish. We have masuza. It's cool. It's there. But here's the point. The point isn't necessarily, you know, put scripture on your doorpost. That's a cool thing, but here's the point. The point is that discipleship, into the ways of Jesus is supposed to happen in your home. Discipleship into the ways of Jesus is not something you drop your kid off at church to do. If that's what you're doing, you're wrong. I'm just going to tell you, the baby's ugly. Again, that's an ugly baby. Do you, parent, have any clue how to disciple your kid? Any. Because you better get some clues. Because it's up to you. It happens in the home. Ground zero for discipling your child is not some Christian school. Those are good. It's not some church program. Those are good. It's you. And if you don't know how to do it, hear that. Hear that. What are you handing down to your kids? Way more than you think. You think it's a godly thing? I'm here to tell you. I deal with kids who grew up in church all the time as adults. It ain't working. It's the stuff you didn't do. That's what they're going to remember. Parents, whatever your family history, Jesus can write you a new one. Now, let me just say this very humbly. I'm just trying to be honest with you. My children at their age are nowhere near where I was at their age. They're doing nothing like I was doing at their age, period. I mean that in a good way. At their age, I was self-destructive. I should not be alive because of the things I did at their age now. Not only are they not doing those things. They love Jesus. How? How did we avoid the, here's the thing, I'm not smart enough. We're not the greatest parents. But here's the reality. The how is not a how. It's a who. And his name is Jesus. We did our best to love him. We did our best to live 100% for him. No church games, no Christian garbage, trying to live for Jesus best we can and journey with our children, which means they admit did dumb stuff and we walk with them through it without making them feel like idiots or failures by just saying, is that who you want to be? And they said, no. And we're like, it can be better. We can do this. And they did. If God's people would have followed the Shema, their family history would have been different as mine is. And I'm no genius. 19th century evangelist D.L. Moody ran a famous Sunday school whereby he reached just thousands of kids in Chicago for Christ at the end of the 1800s. One day he met a little girl on the street running around. He invited her to his Sunday school class, and she said, oh, okay, I'll come, and never came. One week became a month, became two, became three. He started to get a little perturbed, and one day he saw her. He saw her down the street. And he saw her, and she saw him. And you know what she did? She ran. You know what he did? 
He ran after her. Dale Moody weighed 350 pounds. He's a big man. So she ran down the street. He ran down the street. She ran down an alley. He ran down an alley. She ran through a saloon. He ran through the saloon. She ran up the stairs in the back. He ran up the stairs in the back. She ran through her front door and dove under her bed. He ran through the front door and reached underneath her bed. He pulled that girl out by the foot and hung her up in the air. He said, you're coming with me. And thus began a relationship whereby that girl became a follower of Jesus Christ. Many years later, D.L. Moody's associate, Dr. R.A. Torrey, was in Nashville. And a man came up to him. He said, are you Dr. Torrey? He said, yes, I am. And he began to tell him a story about his mother, who had been dragged out from underneath the bed by D.L. Moody, and how she led her many siblings to Christ and her mom and had a whole bunch of kids. And he's one of them. And all of them are followers of Jesus Christ. And it turns out that what D.L. Moody did, he didn't just pull a little girl out from underneath the bed. He pulled the family out from underneath the bed. He pulled generations out from underneath the bed. Now, here's the point that I don't want you to miss. Awesome, D.L. Moody. That's great. That's not the point. Here's the point. The point is the girl. For faithful people of God, Jesus is what runs in their family. What ran in her family? Jesus. She did not fail in her responsibility to pass down, up and down, Jesus Christ to her family. For the faithful people of God, Jesus Christ runs in the family. He is the new family history. Let's pray together. God, we humble ourselves before you today. We just acknowledge that you are awesome. You are a God of love, and you extend to us an opportunity to be your children. Thank you, God, that you are the God of the covenant, the God of generations, that you are ever faithful to your promise and ever faithful to your people who are in Jesus Christ. With heads bowed and eyes closed, there are some of you here today, uh, maybe you're a Christian, maybe you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, and I believe the Spirit of God has spoken something to you. If you're a Christian with head bowed and with eyes closed, here's my question. Before God and in his presence, what has the Spirit spoken to you? Is there a rival God in your life that is getting in the way of God's work in your family? Now is your moment in prayer to name that and to give it over to God. Maybe as a parent, God is putting his finger on a, a disordered love. Maybe something, his, you love something more than God. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job or a thing or a hobby. Maybe some of you as parents, God has put his finger on that. Now is your time, and this is your moment to surrender that back to God. Some of you, as a parent, maybe you've forgotten God. Maybe you've not been passing him down to your children, and thus... You've forgotten him, and your kids are forgetting him as well. Maybe God wants you today, Christian, to renew your vows right here and right now. If you're a Christian, in your heartfelt prayer in the presence of God is, God, I want Jesus to run in my family. If that's your prayer, raise your hand right now because I want to pray for you. God, I pray right now that by the power of your spirit, you would break cycles and you would rewrite a new family history in each one who's raising their hand right now. God, we surrender ourselves to you and your purpose, and we pray that you would be God, God alone in our lives, no rival beside and no competitor, that you, God, would have your way, and we would do our diligence to journey with you and our children together, learning to love you, learning to walk through the days and the messes and the stuff of life, transferring to our children a loyal love of Jesus Christ. May it be so. May it be so. May it be so. There are others of you here today as we continue praying. Uh, truth is, you're not a Christian. Maybe you're like that wilderness generation in that you've been wandering through life. Maybe you feel like you're wandering around. Maybe you feel like you're kind of dying on the inside as well. Well, the reality is God brought you to this moment today so that you might become a child of God, so that you might break cycles in your own life, that you might get a new family history that you might find in Jesus Christ. 
all that you've been looking for in your wanderings. Scripture says it this way, John 1, 12. For all who received him, Jesus, for those who believed in his name, God gave the right to become children of God. If you want to become a child of God, if you want to be one of God's people today, it's as simple as A, B, C, A. Admit that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. B, believe on Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the grave to make you brand new. And then C, to call upon Jesus Christ. The scripture says whoever calls on Christ will be saved. You will be forgiven. You'll become one of God's people and God will put his spirit Spirit in you, and you will have new life, and he will begin writing a new family story beginning now. If your prayer is, Christ, I need you. Christ, I want you. Jesus Christ, I'm calling on you right here and right now. Just go ahead and lift your hand up right now. Lift it up high if that is your prayer. Hands going up all around the room. Others of you, if that's your prayer today, Christ, come into my life. Jesus, I need you. I want you. Please come into my life. Raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Jesus, I commit myself to you. Go ahead and do that. Hands are going up all over the place. Well, his hands are going up. Let's, let's take a moment. You can pray with me just in the quiet of your own heart. And you can say, dear God, I need you. I am a sinner and I need a savior. Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God, that you died for my sins, that you rose from the grave. Forgive my sins. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. Thank you for forgiveness and thank you for new life, for it is in your name that I pray. Amen. And everyone said, amen. Let's celebrate together, Colonial. Amen.